because my partner Rockybold is still in jail. I'll take over today. I'm Herbert Froggy Frog. Today I want to start with the story of the fish. But wait, what is a fish anyway? Opinions are already divided here. In the English language, many invertebrates are also referred to as fish, such as shellfish, jellyfish, and starfish and many others. In other languages too, the term is often contradictory, so there is the term tintenfish for squid in German, although it is a mollusk. To create clarity here, I will really limit myself to the fish in the actual sense, containing chordates and vertebrates. But most of the creatures we will get to know, have very little to do with fish today. Where should I start? Like any good evolutionary story, that of the fish begins deep in the Precambrian. With the collapse of the old supercontinent Rodinia, the boring billion is coming to an end. This was a extremely long time of little tectonic activity. The unicellular ancestors of all animals today lived about 800 million years ago. They belonged to the group of the Chonoflagellates. As the name suggests, these little animals equipped with a long flagellum have a collar hem made of fine fibrous protuberances. Like any unicellular organism, they multiply through cell division. The male sperm cell is still reminiscent of this early ancestor, but is not itself capable of dividing, because of its reduced set of chromosomes. Life begins with fertilization, when one of the sperm cells penetrates the egg cell. Only one sperm can do it, but the others do something equally interesting. They surround the much larger egg cell and even set it in motion. There is a trigger from the egg that attracts it. But what is going on here probably happened 800 million years ago. Over time, solid connections emerged that became more and more complex. At the end of this development was the sponge. This most primitive of all multicellular cells consists of a supporting framework, but the actual biomass consists of chonoflagellates. The cooperation, the common flagellation, allows the food particles to penetrate the tubular sponge structures. Like all multicellular cells, sponges also multiply. At some point you have reached the maximum size of the housing and there are too many residents. In order to get better chances, the new young sponge needs a certain degree of mobility to start. It begins its existence as a larva, and this initially consists of a simple hollow ball of sponge cells. It is probably also the first simple stage of multicellular life on the way to fish. Of course, the sponge larvae will eventually settle down and start setting up a new colony. But about 750 million years ago some of these simple mobile multicellular cells began a new way of life. The so-called placozoa are one of the lesser known forms of life, and their inclusion into the tree of life is still associated with great uncertainties. Like the larvae of the sponges, they are hollow bodies that enclose a cavity. But in contrast to the simple sponge larvae, some cells have specialized here, and so this life form knows an up and down. This is also achieved by the fact that the cell structure is flattened. The placozoa turn their underside over the floor and thus form a temporary stomach area. On the one hand, there is the approach to folding, but also to the formation of an inner body cavity. But then something dramatic happens that is often related to the decay of Rodinia. Global glaciation occurred 717 million years ago as a result of massive leaching of carbon dioxide. This is called Sturtian glaciation, or, affectionately, snowball earth. In this way life disappeared under a kilometer thick ice cover that only dissolved again 663 million years ago. But contrary to all imaginable early plants and animals survived, including our placozoa-like ancestors. The next group of animals, the cnidarian and ctenophores, continue to fold, so that the underside finally becomes the endoderm. This encloses a cavity that serves as the stomach. Of course, today's cnidarians are a lot more complex and have diversified cells, but they have also undergone a lot of evolution. This stage is thought to have been reached about 660 million years ago. Unfortunately, cnidarians and ctenophores only consist of soft parts and are usually not preserved in fossil form. So processes and the point in time can only be determined from molecular data, namely the genetic distance to us. The development of the embryos also gives us important clues about a possible scenario. 
What makes the whole thing even more complex is the fact that precisely the times of the most important developments in the multicell area collide with another major icing. The Marinone glaciation began 650 million years ago and, according to the classical understanding, extinguished all multicellular life. But this was obviously not the case. On the contrary, during this time an inner group of cells developed in a group of coelenterates, which became the second cotyledon, the mesoderm. The flatworms of the Echolomorpha type apparently represent this phase of development. They have a mesoderm tissue that was, however, still compact and has no body cavity. The mouth is at the bottom and is also considered the excretory organ. However, there are other views on this. For example that these flatworms have regressed from deuterostomes. In any case, they are a good model for this early stage of multicellular life. The mesoderm finally filled the cavity and created a new body cavity, the coelom. This development was probably completed about 630 million years ago, because this is where the two largest divisions of the animal kingdom, the protostomes and the deuterostomes, separate. The fundamental difference in the two groups became apparent in the gastrulation process that now follows. While with the protostomes the mouth remained a mouth and the new breakthrough became the anus, with us deuterostomes the original mouth is the anus and the actual mouth is created as a product of the breakthrough. The perforation of the intestine or mouth also led to the end of radial symmetry. From now on, the animals had a front and a back, a place to eat, and a place where the indigestible is excreted. The controversial fossil vernonimalcular is just fitting. It perfectly demonstrates what it might have looked like. But we do not necessarily have to fall back on questionable fossils. The larvae of starfish also have this basic blueprint. The ambulacraria are also the oldest class of the deuterostomes. In the case of starfish, however, this bilateral symmetry is given up again in favor of a strange radial symmetry. The line of the ambulacraria split away around the time of the brief gaseous glaciation. In any case, the deuterostomes separate into the ambulacraria, which also includes the hemichordates and the chordates. We are still a long way from the fish as we know them. During the Ediacaran, some of these chordates formed an innovation, the not a chord. This broke the symmetry again, because from now on there was not only a front and a back, but also a bottom and top, a left and a right. This is basically the symmetry that we deuterostomes all live with. Because the knotted chord initiated an important process, it folded part of the ectoderm into a neural tube, and this formed a new cell type, the nerve cells. In the area of the mouth, where sensory organs are to be expected, which were already located in vernon immacula, the nerve tissue developed thicker. The first preliminary stage of a brain was now there. But the broken symmetry now also made it possible for the upper side of the animal to lengthen and form a first tail. The nerve cells thus also fired the first muscle cells formed from the endoderm. The larvae of hemichordates, a group of ambulacraria that also form a knotted chord in the larval stage, demonstrate how the development should go on. With them, the digestive area begins to expand to include a respiratory system. It was helpful that the oxygen content rose massively during the Ediacaran. And with this oxygen system that now surrounded the stomach area, the muscles could be supplied with more energy. Finally, this gill intestine forms its own opening, as can be seen well in the larvae of the tunicates. This system is maintained even after the tunicates have settled down. The tunicates have been fossilized since the Ediacarium 555 million years ago. But this also means that tunicates and the later fish have already parted ways. Even before the tunicates, the group of cephalochordates separated, today represented by the lancelet. An early form of such a lancelet was the Cambrian picaia. Compared to the simpler sea squirt larvae, they had two additional elements, an organ on the back that later became a fenage, and a simple blood system. Picaia also had a simple neck shield. An eye is also present here, even if a rudimentary light organ can already be assumed in earlier forms. In the modern lancelet, a new organ has also developed, the liver, which, with its secretions, is helpful in digesting fatty food. 
The oldest known fossils of cephalochordids are of Cathamerus in China, which are 525 million years old. The Canadian Picalia is around 10 million years younger. Then their way through the ages becomes very sketchy. The next representative can be found with Paleobranchiostoma in the Permian, and after another long gap the modern lancelet. Genetically, they separated from the olfactors in the middle Ediacaran. We also see the beginning of this development with the tunicates. It appears that the sister group, the primordial vertebrates, also had gills, bloodstream, and livers, but they would develop other organs as history progressed. In the original vertebrates, a similar neck shield has been transformed into a kind of skull. A heart also enables optimal blood circulation, and the new kidney organ cleans the blood regularly. The resulting waste materials are excreted from the anus-like fesses. According to rumors, a vertebrate lived in the Ediacaran, which is said to have reached a considerable size of almost 30 centimeters in length. This creature probably looked like a tadpole, so not really like a fish yet. It had a fin hem that aided in movement. So far the essence is controversial and ignored. But actually the stage of development can also be derived without fossils. The Cambrian Vitulicolia, which are currently regarded as a sister group to the vertebrata, should appear similar in terms of model. Fossils of these strange creatures were found in China, Canada, and Greenland during the Middle Cambrian. They have a thick trunk and a tail, and gill holes can be seen on the side of the trunk. Even if the fossil Vitulicolia are not direct ancestors of the vertebrates, they nevertheless give a strong impression of the possible appearance of the earliest vertebrates. Schemella with its long tail is particularly interesting here. In any case, the first vertebrate diversification began as early as the upper Ediacaran, perhaps between 560 and 550 million years ago. In any case, there are survivors here who, with the help of their genes, lay a trace in this time, namely the lampreys and the hagfish. They separated from the rest of the fish about 540 million years ago. This is also the only thing that is reasonably fixed as their relationships with fossil species have been revised over and over again. The version I'm showing here is what people think about it right now, but the family tree construction kit has often been changed quite radically in recent years. So what I'm telling you here reflects more opinions than a cemented truth. The version shown here is therefore rather fleeting. It is possible that a group of the early vertebrates separated during the Ediacaran, because residues of the so-called periconodonts can already be found at the beginning of the Cambrian. In general, they are placed among the conodonts, of which they appear to be the forerunners. Hardly anything is known about their appearance, because as with the later conodonts, tiny tooth-like fragments are the only remnants of the periconodonts. These differ in their clearly more primitive structure. There are studies that show that the later conodonts represent a further development. The two main groups of periconodonts appear at the beginning of the Cambrian. The last representatives disappear with the end of the Ordovician. The position of the periconodonts is not entirely clear. Here I present them as a subgroup of all other anatha due to their early appearance. Both groups face a difficult test at the end of the Ediacaran because the Ediacaran ends as it once began with an glaciation over. The Bacon glaciation overlaps with significant upheavals in the animal kingdom. On the one hand, the Ediacaran fauna is disappearing, and on the other, more and more living things begin to form shells. This phase, the small shells, represent the transition of life from the Precambrian to the Cambrian. Mineral excretions are built into the biomass, or formed into housings, or they form internal support structures such as bones. Probably shortly after the end of the glaciation, the anatha split into two lines. However, this notion is still relatively new, and in recent years there have been various different models of the evolution of the Cambrian vertebrates. As already mentioned, molecular data suggest that today's hagfish and lampreys separated from the rest of the vertebrates at the beginning of the Cambrian. The role of Cambrian fossils like A. cowichthys and Mylacan minglia has also been reinterpreted from time to time. For convenience, I will refer to the two groups as Anatha 1 and Anatha 2. First, I will now cover the group of Anatha 1. It includes the hagfish and lampreys as well as their fossil relatives, but there are also two extinct groups, the conodonts and the anaspids. 
The anaspids had been placed near the cyclostomes for some time, but otherwise they were placed closer to the armored jawless ones. First, let's look at the cyclostomes, the group to which the hagfish and lampreys belong. Unfortunately, the fossil documentation of these primitive animals is extremely sketchy. Lampreys are fossilized only from the upper Devonian, the hagfish even only from the upper Carboniferous. As with the lancelet, the tradition of these primival fish is very sketchy. The modern representatives have no jaw, a long snake-shaped body with two dorsal fins and a caudal fin, but without pectoral, ventral and anal fins. Their mouth has no jaw and is a round hole. The hagfish are mainly scavengers, while the lampreys are parasites. With the help of small tooth-like structures, they bite pieces from their victims. The great itch thiologist Louis Agassiz was the first to suspect that the canodents used as key fossils could be residues of primeval vertebrates. That is a big step, because until a few years ago we only knew about the canodents their different teeth. They are often very limited in time and therefore helpful for stratigraphic dating. Eventually the view prevailed that canodents are animals armed with small teeth, similar to the lampreys. They have been present since the upper Cambrian. However, this classification is temporary, and some would rather see it as cephalochordate, relatives of the lancelet. As far as can be seen today, the family tree of the canodents is broad. The main groups are the caveodonti and the significantly larger group of the euconodonts. The caveodonti are mainly known from the Ordovician and the Silurian. The different tooth shapes were used to create a complex family tree that extends from the lowest Cambrian to the end of the Triassic. The following slides show the escalating family tree of the Euconodonts. The age of the canodents ended with the Triassic mass extinction. We already know a lot more about the body structure of the anaspids. These were formerly combined with other jawless armored fish to form the group of anatha. The anaspids are now interpreted as an isolated branch that, together with canodents and cyclostomes, faces all other vertebrates. However, the anaspids appear quite late, namely in the upper Silurian but they disappear from the scene before the end of the Devonian. In contrast to their relatives, these armored prehistoric fish had an anal fin, and in some of them one could even assume approaches of pectoral fins, whereby these have the shape of an elongated fin edge. Overall, their body is also significantly more fish-shaped than that of the canodents and cyclostomes. Thanks to their armor, they are also well preserved in fossil form. Despite some progressive trays, they are no longer directly seen as the ancestors of today's fish. Despite their late appearance, the anaspid group must have separated from the sister group as early as the Cambrian. They sneak through three epochs almost unnoticed and suddenly appear unexpectedly. Most of the representatives of Anatha 1 are rather small animals, no longer than 5 to 15 centimeters. While the canodonts and cyclostomes have a rather elongated, eel-like body shape, the anaspide appear in the characteristic fish shape. What they all have in common is that they have dorsal and caudal fins. The special feature of the canodonts are their oversized bulging eyes. The second group of the jawless fish has seen a lot of changes in recent years. Until the discovery of Hay Cowichthys in 1993, it was considered certain that the first fish did not appear until the Ordovician. The Picaia fossil seemed to indicate that only simple cephalochordate lived during the Cambrian. The surprise was great when more and more Cambrian prehistoric fish were found. At the beginning, 
People thought differently about fossils, like hay cowichthys and mylac and mangia, bringing them close to today's lampreys and hagfish. Similarities with these are also undeniable. These animals also had a long fin edge, but the dorsal fins do not seem to have differentiated yet. These representatives were clearly at the beginning of the development. And since they were the same age and even older than Picalia, the previously valid idea of the age of vertebrates had to be revised. However, there are also differences to the cyclostomes and canodonts, so the body is shorter and stockier, or even fisher. You really can see here that an early creature aspires to become a fish. Just an inch long, they were tiny and probably always on the lookout for big predators like an Amalocaris. What they lacked in strength and armor, they made up for in agility. Over the years, even more fossil representatives of the Cambrian have joined them, so that a certain biodiversity must have existed as early as 530 million years ago, including a new family, the Yunnanazunidae, whose representatives Heikauella and Yunnanazun still have basic characteristics such as the cirrus and the mouth area. Some additional members of the Mylac and Mingidae family were also found. Metasprigina, the first representative of this group outside of China, was also discovered in Canada. Both fossils and genetics shift the split between the two fundamental groups of vertebrates to the earliest Cambrian. What the ancestors of the Cambrian fish looked like remains speculative. The Yun and Zunidae disappeared 513 million years ago, the representatives of the Mylac and Mingidae 501 million years ago. This still leaves a gap of almost 15 million years to the formerly oldest representatives of the jawless fish, the Arendaspida. However, the Polyospondylus living in the Divinian is also assigned to the Mylac and Mingidae. The oldest known armored fish appears is the 15 cm long Arendaspis. Not dissimilar to the earlier Haykowichthys in terms of body proportions, its special feature was a massive armor that covered the front body. The rest of the body was surrounded by a raft hem. No approaches for anal fin or pectoral fins can be made out. The Arendaspidiformes are combined with the Heterastrochomorphy to form the group of the Teraspidomorphy. They all share the basic blueprint. However, the shapes of the armor became more and more complex and spiky protrusions formed. One possible purpose of these armors can be deduced from the Ordovician fauna. Monstrous nautiloids and sea scorpions made the seas a dangerous place for small fish. A strong armor can be a significant advantage here. Is only an opinion. Maybe the reasons are completely different. Some of the armors look as if they are already imitating pectoral fins. But it only looks like this. It is just a rigid head armor. For example the Trachloraspis. The Cyathaspida, which emerged a little later, on the other hand, remained to the simple armor of their ancestors. The Cardapelter armor, in keeping with its name, has a heart shape. During the Devonian, the last two groups of these armored fish emerged. The Amphiaspidida mainly developed simple forms, some also somewhat flattened. The armor plates are fused into a single massive segment. Finally, the most diverse armor composed of several segments can be found among the Teraspidida forms. Sodoriaspis quite obviously imitates a modern sawfish. The outgrowths of the armor are directed upwards in many species, so that the impression of a dorsal fin can arise. The Drepanaspide form heavy flat shapes. A long thorn has attached itself to the nose of Rhinopteraspis. The last hour struck no later than 382 million years ago. The so-called age of fish was at its peak. Fish with jaws were making the seas unsafe as gigantic predators, and some other fish were just preparing to leap to the dryland. The Teraspidomorphy developed more and more refined forms towards the end of their time, but this in no way made up for their lag compared to their competitors armed with jaws, pectoral fins and even ventral fins. They were clearly at a disadvantage in the fight for food, and the new top predators were not impressed by their armors. Now we have reached the red point. What did this ancestor of all today's fish look like? Probably not unlike an Arendaspis, but it probably had no armor. This will also be missing in the next generation of jawless fish, the Thelodonte. Armed only with tail and dorsal fin, he swims towards a great future. If he is also tiny, and at the lower end of the food chain, his offspring will become top armored predators, some will develop a new breath after tentative attempts to survive on land and some very daring 
will eventually even find their way on land. Their cousins remaining in the sea will become giants who either filter peacefully or terrorize every other species through their aggressive behavior. Above all, however, they will eventually gain control of the water with over 30,000 species. But these are other stories, and our anonymous ancestor still has a long way to go. For the time being, however, he has achieved a great deal, has turned from a simple cell pellet into a highly organized form of life, and has survived a whole series of apocalyptic situations in the process. Let us pay him our respects for this. Thank you all for your attention. It's time to break out. I think I know a way. I'm free. 